So we're dealing with um, a topic that many uh, are very confused about and perhaps some people um, land on one side or the other and may not have ever studied the issue through the Word of God. And so uh, that happens with a lot of theological issues. People just f- shoot from the hip even people that are churchgoers and not necessarily knowing what God's counsel is on something, but assuming God's counsel on something. Therefore, the problem is starting with one's experience or one's thoughts or worldviews and not starting with the Word of God ends up being the problem. And you'll normally come out uh, with the wrong answer. Uh, You'll come out Um, like Cain giving God what you think he should receive and God rejects it instead of being like Abel who says, God, this is what you have taught me and I'm giving back to you that which you desire and he receives it. So we're looking uh, at the second paragraph concerning the civil magistrate. And what is a civil magistrate? From If you remember from last week. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> All right, Jose, what's a civil magistrate? Civil magistrate, uh, someone that's in, in position in government? Yes. So, oh, I didn't hear that. Political official. Oh. Or it could be someone um, in, in terms of government, not just a politician. Um, it could be the police chief or the general of the military. Uh, all of these, the biggest, the, the the overarching umbrella is, we work for the government and we're here to help you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right. So now, can Christians be in public office and serve as the civil magistrate? Right. If Pastor Peter wanted to run for president of the United States. Is that outside of the purview of Scripture, right? You have my vote. You got two votes. I've gotten two or three over here. There you go. I'm sure you got Claudia's vote. Well, maybe not. She might not want you in that position. All right. She she did this. All right. That's what we're that's what we're going to go to now. That's what this whole lesson is going to be based on. So, paragraph two states the Christian's involvement in the office of the civil magistrate. Right. So here is the answer that is given in 1689. Then we're going to unpack this answer. It is lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of a magistrate when called thereunto in the management whereof as they ought especially to maintain justice and peace according to the wholesome laws of each kingdom and commonwealth. So for that end, they may lawfully now under the New Testament wage war upon just and necessary occasions. All right, and there are several uh, verses there that backs up the statements concerning the paragraph. So we're going to look at two overall headings, and the first one will be its ethical uh, propriety, which means the lawfulness of a Christian fulfilling as the civil magistrate. So we see the beginning of the first paragraph. It is lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of a magistrate when called thereunto. So there's a man named Menno Simmons, where we get the Mennonites from, uh, who believe the civil magistrate is totally secular and disallowed for members to have any involvement in such affairs. In the 16th century, the Anabaptist believed it was of Satan. Now, the Anabaptists were the rebellious problem children of the Reformation. They were the one firebombing and breaking all of the Roman Catholic statues, right? Um, And just busting them. So they were the problem children. And then Rome turned around and said, see, that's what Protestants do, right? But those were the naughty kids of the Protestant children. 
Others hold it was only for Old Testament times when there were such kings as David and there was a physical kingdom, but God's kingdom is spiritual, and so Christians should not involve themselves with the civil magistracy. This is the thinking of uh, the Mennonites, uh, the Anabaptists, and others. The Christian's relationship to the civil magistrate is an all-important aspect of his witness in the world. And so a proper understanding of governing authorities is vital to being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The New Testament assumes every believer lives under a civil magistrate, and therefore every Christian should have a great interest in this subject. Some refuse to exercise their privilege even to vote. All right, number one, exalted descriptions of the civil magistrate. What does the Bible say about this? Because that's ultimately what matters. If the Bible is for it, we're for it. If the Bible is against it, we're against it. Romans 13, verses 2 through 6. All right. Uh, Greg, nice and loud. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very, to this very thing. Now, now notice how many times you see God mentioned. Right, I underlined it, I believe. Is it underlined and bolded for you? Yes, it is. And so, what does that tell you? All the times God is mentioned. What does that say to you? God is in control. That God is in control. He's over it. He's not under it. He's not unaware. It doesn't say Satan's in control. Even, even though we know that I'm certainly some... Uh, civil magistrates um, are, you know, they're not believers. So ultimately, spiritually, they're following Satan, but they're still under God's authority. There are times when God puts bad people in authority and still his will is carried out. And still his will is carried forth. Think about the crucifixion. It was his will for Christ to die. And in order for that to happen, the religious Jews and the Gentile Romans came together in concert and worked this evil plan to crucify Christ together. And yet the whole time, over the top of that, God was bringing the redemption of our lives through the injustice of the hand of man. Does that not blow our minds? Man thinks he's in control. He thinks he's moving the chess pieces around on the board. Well, that was God's will. It was God's and is God's will and remains God's will. Jesus said to Pilate, you have, you have no authority over me, but it has been given to you from above. There you go. <laughs> said, don't, don't you think that I could I have authority right now to, to, to put you to death and let you go? Right. Pilate said he had the authority, but he did not pinpoint where that authority came from. And Jesus stepped in and said, I'm going to tell you where authority comes from. <laughs> Jesus said, not my will, but God's will be done. And this position of authority is described variously as the ordinance of God, the minister of God, and the servant of God to carry out the wrath of God. These descriptions imply God's favor upon the office of the magistrate and the lawfulness of those who occupy it and execute its functions. Romans 13 includes the duties of bringing praise to those who exercise what is good and punishment upon those exercising evil. Praise and punishment, depending on 
who the civil magistrate is dealing with. He's dealing with somebody breaking in the house, punishment. He's helping the person whose house is being broken into, praise. And including the use of the sword. Okay, and obviously the use of the sword is 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 the use of of the power um, of physical force. And obviously, many people today don't use swords. Uh, they use guns and billy clubs and whatever else. Um, but nevertheless, they're using their physical authority to stop combatants. Secondly, there are godly examples that exercise the office of a civil magistrate. In Luke chapter 3, verse 14, repentant soldiers. You want to read that one for us? Repentant soldiers. Soldiers also asked him, and we shall, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not exalt money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. Right, so they weren't to extort money. They weren't to use their authority to grab a couple shekels extra for themselves. If they did so, they were going to put it in their pocket. And he said, be content with your wages. So soldiers whose duty included waging war repented of the preaching of John the Baptist and were instructed by John in discipleship living. Does John ever say, leave your office? He doesn't say it. He doesn't say stop being a soldier. He just says, be a just, so, a just sh- soldier. Be content. Be a content soldier. All right. Secondly, uh, Carlos, would you read that second one for us? The repentant centurion. Repentant centurion. So I sent for you at once. And you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Amen. So that would be in Acts chapter 10, verse 33. Right? We have a um, a repentant centurion who was in charge of a bunch of sh- soldiers. Genesis chapter 41, verse 39 to 41. Jose. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none of discerning and wise as you are. Uh, you shall be over my house and over all my people and shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now this one I found particularly amazing. Um, And I'm going to explain why. Joseph was elevated to rule in Egypt and received countrywide jurisdiction only second to Pharaoh. Joseph... Um, accepted this position after he was unjustly imprisoned for two years by the same civil magistrate for fictitious crimes. When called to serve, he didn't respond with bitter resentment, declaring the civil magistrate to be an office of evil. But he willingly took the responsibility and carried it out for the good of his fellow man with divinely given wisdom. God placed him in a very strategic and privileged role for such a time as this. What was the time that he took office in? What was happening at that moment? There was a famine in the land, right? What did God give him to carry out his role? How did he carry out it? How did he know what to do? What caused him to devise the plan that he did so that people didn't die? What did God give him? Authority, provisions, but he also gave him the wisdom on how to use the authority and the provisions to carry it out. Because you might make a plan, but that plan may be a short-lived plan. You didn't look at all the angles of the plan. He, He looked at the full scope of the view of such a plan. And he started saving up early. He saved up for a rainy day, or in this case, a famine. And he 
he wasn't jaded. This is, this is what separates the people of God from those who are not believers. The very institution that unjustly threw him in jail, he could have been so jaded. I'm not serving them. I help them. I'm the, I'm the less. They want, they want to use my, my wisdom that God has given me. Forget that. I'm keeping it for myself. I mean, he could have had every fleshly reason to turn down this tremendous opportunity. But he doesn't. And Philip, he's either a slave or in prison for about 13 years. It's amazing. From about 17 to 30. We are to be humbled. We're to be humbled, right? How many people would have gotten jaded and been disgruntled and complained? Oh, they want to, oh now they want to use me. Oh, now I'm somebody. I, I would, but I, I would try to repent afterwards. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> help them? <laughs> Let them help themselves. I mean, could you think of all the things that would probably come to our fleshly minds? Right? Greg, would you be quick to want to help them? After 13 years in jail, probably not. Probably not. Right? You left me there to rot. Now you want to use me? Oh, ho, that's how this government works. Sorry. <laughs> Check, please. What is discernment? Because he gave him discernment. What is discernment? To know right from wrong. To know right from wrong. Right? And wisdom. Wisdom. Solomon could have asked for anything. He asked for wisdom. To make proper judgments. And then God gave him long life and riches to boot. Genesis 45, verses 7 through 8. Uh, Pass Peter, please. And God sent me before you to preserve you uh, a remnant on earth, to keep you alive for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord over his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. What does it mean that God used Joseph up? To preserve a remnant. What does it mean that God used Joseph to preserve a remnant? Well, put him in a position where he could preserve a remnant. <laughs> right. And a remnant would be the, the, the chosen people of God. I was going to say that um, God kept his promise to Abraham. Yeah. He did. Now, you don't have this on your sheet, but I want you to listen to this. And I want you to be enamored by this reality of what God has done. God's sovereignty and the chain of events in Joseph's life. If, jo if Joseph's brothers did not sell him to the Midianites, Joseph would have never gone to Egypt. If Joseph never goes to Egypt, he would have never been sold to Potiphar. Then Potiphar's wife would have never falsely accused him of rape. He would have never been thrown in prison. If never in prison, he would have never met and interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh's baker and butler. Since he interpreted the dreams, he was given the task of interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. Since he interpreted their dreams, he was elevated to prime minister. As prime minister, he wisely prepared for the severe upcoming worldwide famine. <clears throat> he impacted and cause many lives to live, including his own family in Canaan who would have perished because of the famine. If he perished, Judah would have not been saved. Since Judah lived, Jesus would come as the lion of the tribe of Judah to save his people from their sins. If Jesus never came, you would have remained dead in your sins and trespasses and would face God's holy and righteous wrath with no hope of salvation. Since God raised up Joseph, it led to his son Jesus coming into the world to save his people from their sins. Did you ever see all that? Did you ever realize all that? No, no, they didn't. But Joseph had enough wisdom to say, God sent me ahead. God did this. It was his brother's hands physically that sold him into slavery. But it was God's overarching hand that pushed him toward Egypt to make all of this happen so that you and I could be sitting here in Sunday school saved and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb today. 
we know that nothing happens by accident with God. Every moment that we live is by the will of God. Amen. Sometimes to test us, sometimes to chasten us. That's right. And what other um, civil magistrates did God raise up? Any other names come to mind besides Joseph? Okay, Daniel. Solomon. Okay. Nehemiah. King Josiah. Hezekiah. I mean, Esther ended up to be um, the the wife of the king. She definitely had an influential position. And that's why, well, Haman didn't make it. (laughs) And the Jews were spared. So yes. Does this affirm or deny that God's people can serve as the magistrate? Can they serve or can't they serve? They They can. There is differences in the forms of government for sure, and the lands that they were in. If we were to serve in government today, we'd be more like Daniel or or Nehemiah, right? Because they served under an unbelieving government. Sure. Josiah was part of the 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 the, 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 the theocracy. He was in the establishment. (laughs) All right. What type of society do these men serve in? Uh, many of them served in pagan and godless societies of Egypt and Babylon, respectively, and some of them served um, in in Israel, where people were kind of listening. Uh, what did Solomon ask for in his role as king? We said it already. What did he ask for? Wisdom, right? And he asked for wisdom for what reason? To rule the people, right? to rule them with justice and to rule them um, with discernment. Number three, officers and judges. In various places in the Pentateuch, God commanded judges and officers how they were to enforce the civil laws of the nation of Israel. Exodus 22, Deuteronomy 16. Many of these judges and officers would have been believers who performed their duties under God's approval. Number four, civil magistrates are frequently spoken of in favorable, favorably in the book of Proverbs. I put a list of Proverbs, but I uh, fleshed out two of them. Proverbs 16, 12 is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Proverbs 31, 4 to 5. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. So, so you see the grave responsibility um, of a civil magistrate because they make a decision and it affects not just themselves, but a lot of other people, right? Letter B, it's special concern, the main duty of the civil magistrate. The confession says, in the management whereof, as they ought especially to maintain justice and peace according to the wholesome laws of each kingdom and commonwealth. Right? Now, now notice it doesn't say that it's always a theocracy or a democracy or a dictatorship. It doesn't tell you the form of government here because God's word gives us principles it's, it not, doesn't necessarily give us a rule for every situation, right? When you're walking down the street and break your ankle, do this. When you have a call, do that, right? It doesn't give us a law because we would have a book filled just with laws. We do have laws, but we also have principles. What should be the affirmation and denial of every magistrate? Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20. Anthony Velez. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God has given you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe. 
For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God has given you. Amen. So we, we sort of see the heart and the mindset that they are supposed to have. Magistrates should be appointed and follow justice, which is a biblical standard. Right? Social justice is not biblical justice. This, this cultic uh, philosophy that has been thrust upon and tried to be rammed down our throats. That's not, there's only justice and injustice. Injustice is sin. Hands down. We have a better standard than the social justice warriors. They have a man-centered standard. Jose. It's just, just a question regarding you know, this, this statement, Deuteronomy 16, 18, 20. Not show sure partiality. And I'm thinking, um, in, in, in light of, the, of our culture today, with the LGBTQ issues and you know, substance and all this kind of stuff, you know, you're a believer... And you're 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 you're, you're surrounded by people that, that want to forward their agenda. Yeah. Okay. And sad to say, I've heard of, of believers that they're in government, but yet you know they they don't they don't stand against biblical principles. They go with the common the flow. Right. The common flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I'll give you a good example. Uh, the 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 case in Texas when it came to abortion. You know, it, it was almost going to be passed, you know, to make it illegal, but they called it a pro-life group, you know, and, and, and it was not passed. And I, if I'm right, I think Mike Johnson, you know, the, the speaker also in Louisiana had a similar case. What do you do, you know, or, or what should a believer do when, when, you're, when you're there? You know, you want to govern biblically, but yet you have this, this forum here. That's telling you, well, you gotta go this way. One, one more, one, one more example, and, and, and I still, I'm wait. Let me let, wait just for the sake of time. Let me let me. So, when when a Christian is a civil magistrate, they have to rule according to wisdom and truth, right? Mm -hmm. So, I'm not going to give special treatment mm -hmm. to any group per se. No one gets special treatment. This person gets equal justice under the law. So if, if someone went in and beat up a homosexual and, and we prosecute the person and beat up that homosexual, we're doing what's just and right. We're not pushing the homosexual agenda. We're, we're saying that someone attacked an image bearer of God and they should be protected. Just as much as if they attacked a heterosexual sinner. They get the same justice under the law. We don't push ungodly and unbiblical agendas. If they say we wanna, we wanna have a parade and, and, and be able to march in front of all the churches as our right. No, we wouldn't endorse that because that's not, a parade is not necessarily a right. So, we must govern according to the law, to the nth degree. So here we see in why pray for magistrates. First Timothy chapter two, verses one through four. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessors, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the clear goal of our prayers for our civil authorities is our tranquility of life, which leads to promoting the prosperity of the gospel so that it will not be hindered. Our basic attitude can be one of supported prayers for the Christian civil magistrate to govern via Romans 13 and to spread the gospel to non-believing magistrates so that they might do the same, but also come to salvation. So let me clean that up. So we have Mike Johnson, who is said to be a believer, right? And he may or may not make some choices that we would agree with or not agree with, right? Because even believers 
can make wrong choices at times. Um, and so we, we, we need to pray, you know, God, let him keep his eyes upon you. Let, let him stick to the word of God. Uh, let him share the gospel with other civil magistrates that they might know the word of God. If he's wrong, let him humbly admit that he was wrong on something. Uh, let him not be swayed by the cultural ungodly winds. All of those things. And so this is, this is what we need to do, right? Because it'd be very easy. Mike Johnson screws up. And I thought, what kind of Christian is he? Right? Of course, of course. So he'll lose on both sides. He'll lo- right with, with the left. He's an and he's an extremist. Right? He's a Bible basher. If he does something, right? All of that. If he does something that we personally in this room would say, I I don't think that was the right choice. Then we could say, what kind of Christian is that? Right? Did the, did the disciples always make the right choices? No. no. That, we don't need to excuse it and say, well, you know what? Everybody makes mistakes. We can't. We just all get along. No. God, let him not do that again. <laughs> God, let him see. This, this, this was the wrong way to go. This wasn't following your word. Or the, this wasn't following the Constitution. Let him, let, let him rethink this. Or it could be God's plan. Of course. Well, ultimately, God will ultimately do all things, yeah, for his own will. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you've got to have the wisdom to govern rights. Correct. All right, say it again, Greg. That's a great point. Just because you're a Christian, you put in a position of government like Jonathan, doesn't mean that everything you do is going to be right. You still need wisdom to know how to govern. That's what we pray. We pray that they'll have the wisdom to make the right decisions. Amen. What are some, what are the wholesome laws of each kingdom and commonwealth? Well, the confession recognized that there is no theocracy in the New Testament as existed in the Old Testament in which the civil laws of the nation were given directly from God. Under the New Testament, there will be kingdoms and commonwealths which will have wholesome laws referring to that which is favorable to morals, religion, prosperity, conducive to public happiness, virtue, or peace. Wherever such wholesome laws exist, it is the duty of the magistrate to uphold and carry them out according to his office and authority. Now, I added this in that that I guess most may not uh, add in, but are imprecatory prayers ever appropriate concerning government? Do we know what imprecatory prayers are? Go ahead. What are they? It's those prayers to God where you um, call for God to deal with the ungodly, to wipe them out. Yeah, they're fiery, judgmental prayers. When the government acts unjustly, imprecatory prayers may be appropriate. Maybe. These are highly emotionally charged prayers, often in the Psalms, which record the writer's heart cry to God for divine deliverance from the psalmist's troubles and pain. Psalm 3-7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on their cheeks, and you break the teeth of the wicked. And I believe the teeth are like the hardest bones in the body. We can lift our voices, not our swords. We lift our voices, not our swords, and pray for God either to convert or to curse the enemies of God and His kingdom. Realize that God brought the greatest justice out of the secondary causes of injustice in light of the unjust crucifixion of Christ as the Jews crucified Jesus as a blasphemer and the Romans crucified Jesus as a rebel insurrectionist, threatening Roman peace and a rival to Caesar. But on the third day, God vindicated him via the resurrection. And there's some additional imprecatory psalms if you want to look at them. Let her see the particular prerogative. The civil right, the right of the civil magistrate to wage war so far that end they may lawfully now, under the New Testament, wage war upon just and necessary occasions. So the confession asserts that the civil magistrate, under the New Testament, has the prerogative to wage war in certain conditions. Now, I didn't include this, but if you're interested in checking out Augustine's 
just war. He has three areas that he carries out, but I did not include that in here, but I'm well, well aware of them. Luke 3, 14. The soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? And he said, do not intimidate anyone or accuse anyone falsely. Be content with your wages. And again, John doesn't ask them to lay down his weapons. He instructs them to live in a way that pleases the Lord. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Um, did Jesus require the Roman centurion to leave his profession when he healed his servant? Remember when he said, just say the word and my servant will be healed. And he said, I've never seen such faith. No, not in Israel. Did he tell the Roman centurion, I've healed your servant. Now leave your, now leave your job. No, he doesn't do that. Why not? God can use him. What do you think that Roman centurion is going to go back and tell his fellow officers? <laughs> God used him. He's going to tell them what Christ did. <laughs> he didn't say, you know, throw down your sword and your helmet. You know? Romans 13, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God's, uh, he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. What's the purpose of the sword mentioned here in Romans 13? To punish lawbreakers. Punish. Punish. And so Paul affirms the right of the government official to justly wage war, carrying out military actions to put an unjust rebellion down. But it's ain't token that war makes murderers of men. Well, not, not necessarily. It could, but not necessarily. If someone attacked our country and our country killed those who were attacking the country, is our country murdering people? Or defending, because there there was a difference. How can waging war upon just and necessary occasions be defined? Would it have <clears throat> would it have been unjust if a Christian magistrate defended against Hamas? So let's say that there was a Christian magistrate in place of Netanyahu, if I said his name right, and he said, um, "We were attacked, and we're going to defend ourselves now." Would that have been unjust? No, right? Now, there'll be differing opinions on to what these occasions are concerning the confession. And there's a distinction between offensive and defensive wars. In offensive wars, when one nation seeks to conquer another out of ambitious desire for land, power, wealth, or worldly glory. And I think we see that a lot with like Russia. They, they go in and they, they just try to take over. Most people agree such wars are unjustified. A defensive war is when a nation is attacked and must defend its own people, territory, and way of life. Most agree such a war can be called just and necessary. Number five, does the individual have the same jurisdiction as the magistrate? Do you have the same jurisdiction as the magistrate in your own personal and individual life? Luke 5, 43 and 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Is this dealing with the individual or the public magistrate right here? So we got a law commerce. Well, hang on. <laughs> Who does this apply to right here? Is this individual or is this talking about the civil magistrate? The individual. Talking about the individual. It's not talking about the civil magistrate. Right? So Jesus has the pri uh, Jesus has the private duty of an individual in mind, not the public duty of the magistrate. Do Jesus' words support pacifism in the individual? No. The, the Bible does not forbid self-defense, be it physical or verbal but using wisdom that comes from heaven. So Paul defended himself verbally and said, I'm, I'm a Roman citizen, you can't do this to me, right? So no, that doesn't mean we need to love Hamas, right? 
Romans 12, 9, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will replace, says the Lord. It is the duty of the civil magistrate to exercise God's wrath against the evildoer. Romans 13, 4, for he is a minister of God's, an avenger to execute wrath on all who practices evil. How do you respond to Christian pacifists applying the sixth commandment that says, but you shouldn't murder when considering capital punishment? What do you do? Right? The pacifist argues, if it is wrong to commit murder, it must be wrong to wage war. It must be wrong to uh, to bring about capital punishment. However, two times in the very next chapter, God commands the taking of life. He who strikes a man so that he dies should surely be put to death. And, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. Exodus twenty one twenty three. How do we reconcile these passages? The answer is found in the distinction between the duty of the private individual and the duty of the magistrate. In the Sixth Commandment, God is addressing the duty of the individual. You shall not murder. You can't walk into a convenience store and you say, I want the milk. And they say, no, you can't have the milk. And boom, you say, that's it. I'm taking you out. In Exodus 21, he's addressing the duty of the magistrate. The civil magistrate has duties which belong to him that do not belong to the individual. And among them is capital punishment and waging of war. So, can Christians be involved in public office as a civil magistrate? Yes. yes. It is lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of magistrate when called upon. Now, I, I put in, uh, some um, application points. If Has anybody seen the movie Amazing Grace, William Wilberforce? This was a great example of a civil magistrate who is a Christian and fought not to just, um, he fought as, as an abolitionist. He didn't just say slavery is wrong. He said, I want it abolished. I want the whole institution ended. Right? This should be our attitude today with abortion. I want the whole thing shut down, period. Not, well, here's the, some exceptions. No, <laughs> not biblically. No, not biblically. So even if a woman's life is uh, could be terminated by not having it done, by not what? Uh, if a woman's life could be terminated if it wasn't done, right? So what? Yeah. So what you do in those cases? You try everything you you can, the doctor. Do everything you can to try to save the baby and my wife. And if if in saving my wife the baby ends up dying, the doctor's not killing the baby trying to save the life and sometimes the baby doesn't live and that that was the case for a friend of mine but that story for another day and the baby lived and the mama lived but three doctors said abort the child today he has a an incredible child who loves god Wonderful. if he would have listened to the doctor the Lord. and his wife is alive too how does how does this understanding of the civil magistrate impact the way you vote? Yeah. How does it? You vote for the one who keeps uh, what's just, that's right, according to God. Yes. Now, don't only look at personalities, right? What do the people stand for? What's on the ballot? What what laws are they going to push and oppose? per se. Justice and injustice. That's what we need to look at. Who is more closely aligned to the scriptures? Even if the civil magistrate themselves is not a believer. And I don't know how many actual believers are, are in the civil magistrate. I'm sh- there are some, right? <laughs> I don't know that anyone running for office in the next presidential election is a believer at all. Yes. When they try to get rid of them. When they tried to, you know, when Democrats tried to uh, impeach, impeach them. Was it right? Is it right now? Is it 
things we do against the um, uh, Biden, given what we read about. Great question. So, are are groups that are trying to oust somebody are they following the rule of law, or are things being made up? Right. So, if you're trying to, so the way law works is there is a crime committed, <laughs> and then that person is indicted, and you and you bring up the evidence and say, "Look, the person committed the crime." Not. I'm going to go after Carlos and I'm going to go and try to dig every piece of dirt out of his life to hang him. That's, that's, not, that's not how it works, right? If, I mean, really, I mean, if, if anybody came after us in some way, shape, or form, would they ever find anything we've done wrong? Yes. To, to hang us for whatever? Absolutely, right? So, it's it's... The scripture says God hates unjust weights. And so you say, all right, I, I want to, I want to shoo this person away. So let me just try to create the dirt, find it and dig and dig and dig because my motive is this guy's gone. So, you know, we, we have to pray that people will follow, will follow the law and be just and not unjust and apply equality across the board in that regards. Because depending on who did it, this person does something and this person does the same crime. And they're like, I'm going to get that guy. This person did the same thing. I will leave him alone. Mm-hmm. All right. In what ways are you praying for the government right now? And when is it appropriate to pray in peccatory prayers? So I'll let you grapple with those. We'll continue next time. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and glorify you for such a time as this. These are important matters. These are matters that impacts our homes and our churches and our lives. And so, Lord, let us use wisdom and let us stick to your word on such things that our government officials may rule with justice and by truth and not according to their own subjective understandings of things and and, and their own agendas that would be outside of those biblical parameters. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.